Um, two weeks ago, I talked about what it, that, that basically help us to understand what this next generation is thinking. Um, I'm uh, part of boomers or Xers. I straddle the, the fence when I want to feel young. I go with the Xers when I want to be more mature and, you know, get that authority that comes from age. I go with the boomers, okay? Um, but we have two groups of people right now that are unchurched, okay? Xers and millennials, and I stated that Jesus it really is not only the author of our faith, but I believe he's the, one, the model that we should follow. Because if anybody was cross-generational, cross-cultural, was Jesus, okay? Left heaven and all its glory to come be with you guys, okay? To be with me. He adapted more than anybody else has ever adapted to reach a uh, the world for Christ with the good, with the good news. Um, and then last week I talked about the fact that we are under spiritual attack and gave us some tools to, that are practical and not hyper spiritual, but practical on how to deal with the attack of Satan. And that was intentional. Listen, our church is under attack Marriages are under attack. Um, friendships, relationships, leadership, we're all under attack. Okay? And, and I said last week, it's too easy to put a face to it. Okay? Um, and for you uh, young folks in here who have children, please don't put your children's face to the attack. Okay? Even though they attack you. Amen? Okay? Because we all have perfect kids in our church. Praise God. Don't put a friend to it. Don't put a coworker or spouse to it. Understand that we fight an enemy that is not of flesh and blood. That's what the Bible tells us. And you know, and the reason that we're under attack is because we have had the audacity to literally storm the gates of hell. And God has replaced that burden on my heart that we should, um, with a passion... Pursue the next generation. Because see, if we had become complacent and say, whew, man, we've made it. Okay, Satan would leave us alone. I got them right where I want them. They're complacent. They're fat and happy. And, you know, I don't need to worry about them. But when not only do we make a proclamation, but we begin to take steps, our enemy attacks. And so today we're going to look at some of those, the model that we need to have for making those steps. And the model that we have is, again, that cross-cultural missionary of all missionaries, okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you agree? Okay? And so we're going to look at um, the mission statement that Jesus uh, says on the front side, leading into his ministry, you know, every organization has a, a mission statement, whether it's a, uh, a church or a business, you know, there's a mission statement to go along with it. Our mission statement, reaching people for Jesus where they are, is an adaptation of what Jesus told the, the world what his model was going to be. I come to seek and to save that which is lost, not to sit still, build a stadium and invite people to come. We're going to go, we're taking it seriously. It's adapting it to our culture and our time, okay? But we find Jesus making, I think, the world's greatest mission statement um, in his first sermon in Nazareth. And this is important for us to look at as we try to understand how we are to engage our culture and how we're to reach the next generation. Jesus said this, um, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And the Bible tells us that after he read that, he looked across the crowd in the, in the synagogue and said, today, this has been fulfilled in your ears. Rolled it up. And set down. If I could only be that precise and succinct and short. Amen? 
okay? I got mad at Rod. He reset the clock, and he cut me out of five minutes this morning, okay? I reset the clock. We're ready to go. Um, you know, some commentators suggest that Jesus began his public ministry in the year of Jubilee, okay? The year of Jubilee was a year of celebration, of liberation, when all debts amongst the Jewish people were done away with, where the captive was set free, those that were enslaved, they were set free. It was a time of celebration. If this would have been the case, that Jesus' message started with the year of Jubilee, it would be especially fitting because Jesus came to set a people free from the heavy burden of religion. The heavy burden of legalism. He came to set us free from sin. And Jesus begins his ministry stating his mission and how he is going to carry it out. You see, in Jesus' day, the Jewish rabbis would taught that there are 613 commands that they must obey. Now, how do you think that would have worked with this little ADD boy? Okay, I struggle keeping 10. You know what I'm saying? Much less 613. People struggled under this heavy, heavy burden. I mean, they made laws about laws. Rules about the rules. You know, the Sabbath was one of the, the, the big days that, that they kept holy and made a big deal of it. You know, it's no wonder that Jesus, you know, his gracious words were embraced by, by those who heard him, is what the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 4. They love to hear the grace, not the legalism. You know, they got mad at Jesus over and over again because the Pharisees did, the religious leaders, the pastors, because he did not reinforce their legalism. He didn't reinforce their laws and their regulations. Instead, Jesus showed us how to love God and how to love others in a way that was real. I'm going to say it in a little bit, but it needs to be said. Jesus literally lived out what the psalmist wrote when he said, Come, taste and see that God is good. It was something that was real, that could be touched. You know, the Sabbath, like I said moments ago, was, was something they kept holy. I mean, they, they went to ridiculous lengths to make sure that they wouldn't work on the Sabbath day. You know, if you were hemming your garment on Friday night to get ready to go to church on Saturday, because that's when they worshipped, and you forgot and left the needle stuck in, your, in the hem of your garment, and you carried it with you all day or part of the day, you know, they would condemn you because you worked on the Sabbath. Because you're not supposed to carry anything on the Sabbath. I mean, these guys went to ridiculous lengths. And you know, Jesus loved, if you will, to rub sand or to rub salt into the Pharisees' wounds. He loved to prove to them that their legalism was destroying them. And on one occasion, you know, Jesus came across a man in John chapter 9 that was born blind. And see, legalism is easy for us to fall back into. And I love this story because we see a couple different perspectives of this man that was born blind and healed on the Sabbath day. We see the, the Pharisees' perspective, the legalism, the, the disdain they had for Jesus because he dared heal somebody, work on the Sabbath. And we see the perspective of the man who was healed. And this is important for us. And then we see also the perspective of his disciples, the twelve. Because see, those twelve came to Jesus and said, Hey, why is this guy blind? See, they fell back into the judgmentalism of legalism. They fell back into the looking at somebody and bringing upon them their own bias, their own prejudice, their own 
craning, if you will, because you know this man must have been blind because his parents either sinned or he sinned. You're that way because of something you've done. Well, listen, that, that man was born blind. So, realistically, whatever, even though he was conceived in sin, realistically, the man at birth had done nothing to cause his blindness. Nothing. Kind of sounds like a little boy who at birth was born mixed up, screwed up. They call it dyslexia. Anybody heard of it? And listen, I carried it for a chip on my shoulder for a long time. Why can't I read? Why don't I write like everybody else? I've, listen, what you don't know, a lot of you don't know is, is you will never receive a handwritten note from me. You say, why? That's so personal. No, that is so stinking scary. I'll misspell my name sometimes. Get my U and my T mixed up. Why? Why would God do that? See, even I bring upon myself and have brought upon myself the burden of why. You know, and I love how Jesus answered this. And some of you out there struggle. Anybody else out there struggle besides me? Why, God? Why? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus said. This happened so that the power of God could be seen. In our weakness, we are strong through God. That's what Paul taught us. You see, this was done so that God could be glorified. He's glorified in my life. Because listen, there's no reason in, on God's green earth that I should be standing up here, or actually sitting now that I've become lazy, okay? Sitting up here, Proclaiming God's word. I stuttered. I'm dyslexic. I can't read in public. I'm tall. I'm skinny. I'm fat. I'm short. Listen, if I stand up here under my power, who gets the glory? Me. Many of you have the same story. A man named Jesus touched your life. So that he could glorify himself through us. And I love what happens. This man, you know, is healed on, sat, on, on, on the Sabbath day. And I love the response of this man. I love how he addresses this issue. Because see, the Pharisees were just absolutely, totally upset. Can you imagine the audacity of disrupting the service by healing somebody? They're right in the middle of the sermon. They're just getting ready to take the offering. And this man comes in, not dressed in fine linen, not acting like any other Pharisee or like the Pharisees of the Sadducee or any other rabbi. Probably was a little grubby. Might have had a hat on his head. I don't know. But he didn't fit the mold. And he walked into the room and dared heal a man in the middle of service. And they're upset. And they come to, come to this man and they say, so, so what happened? Tell us, who healed you? Why did he heal you? What happened? Tell us. And the man replied and says, I think he must have been a prophet, the guy who touched me. I think that man must have been a prophet. And they said, What? What do you mean he was a prophet? No, you tell us more about it. You tell us more. Who was he? Who touched you? Listen, they knew. They knew who he was, who had touched him. But listen to how this man replies. He says, you know, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. Whether Jesus is just an ordinary man. But I know this. I was blind and now I see. I was blind and now I see. You see, Jesus didn't, didn't care what the religious world thought, what the church thought. He was concerned with this man. And this man wasn't concerned with who Jesus was. All he knew is that he had been healed. He'd been touched. 
How many of us have been here touched by Jesus? Now look what Jesus does. And this is, I find remarkable. Luke 9, verse 35 and 38. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, the interrogation of this man, he found the man and asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy says, who is he, sir? You see, he's not certain yet who Jesus is. I want to believe in him. I want to believe in the Messiah. You have seen him. You've seen him. Jesus said, and he is speaking to you now. Look what the guy says. Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. Do you see the progression? Jesus didn't come to him and say, Hey, listen, I'm from the synagogue down the street. And, you know, we have a healing ministry going on and, and we want to preach to you. And then after we preach to you, then I'm going to heal you. And then, now listen, confess all your sins now. We know this came on you because of what you did. No, Jesus simply did good. He simply did good. The man didn't know why. The man didn't know who until Jesus revealed himself to him. The man went from calling him just an ordinary man, a sinner, to calling him possibly a prophet, to worship him as Lord. Listen, the generation that surrounds us I'm going to be honest, is tired of hearing us preach at them. They want to see us love them and to love others. They want us to be who we say we are, who Jesus was. That's what they want to see. That's what they want to know. Did he break the religious rules? Yeah, he did. He's questioned one other time, why did you heal on the Sabbath? Don't you know you're breaking the Sabbath? And Jesus in Luke 6, 9 says to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good, on, to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save or to destroy? You see, they were so concerned with, with keeping the rules and, and, and doing something, being religious, that they were willing to let someone remain blind. <clears throat> willing to allow someone to remain hungry because it would break their rules. Listen, Jesus was concerned about one thing. Loving God and loving others. You know, when we look at his ministry, Jesus, you know, he, 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 did you realize that he never, okay, carried a Bible with him anywhere he went? Never carried a Bible. Never tuck a scroll of Isaiah under his arm and walk through town. You know, I look for every opportunity to do a Bible study, to open God's word and to teach from it. You realize Jesus, there's not a recorded Bible study with his disciples in the whole time? Not one. His sermon that we just looked at, he stood up, read the scripture and said, hey, that's fulfilled, sit down. Jesus never did that. The Pharisees love to open their scrolls and teach and I almost used the word pro pro protificate over and over and over. Pronosticate. That's the word I want. Pronosticate. Mark loves that word. That's why I looked at him. Pronosticate. Yes, pronosticate. Okay? You got to say it correctly in the correct tone. They loved it. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. Although he knew the Bible better, the word of God better than anybody. By the age of 12, he proved that as he just stifled and, and stymied the Pharisees. 
his approach to spiritual life and Bible study was entirely different. Now somebody's sitting here going, oh, well, now pastor telling us we shouldn't do Bible study. Okay, I mean, I got the ladies just met Rose. You got to knock it off. No more Bible study. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying actually is going to be much harder and much tougher. Much harder, much tougher. Because see, the, Jesus was able to, to move about it with, without a Bible in his hand and without trying to impress people with his knowledge and not trying to intimidate people with how well he had memorized scripture and how well he could quote the proper verse at the proper time. Jesus would live with people, dine with them, love them, care for them, and speak spiritual truth into their life using the simple things of life. Luke 8, sitting and watching a farmer sow seed and bring deep spiritual truth. You see, it requires us to know God's word. It requires of us who call ourselves his kids to read it, to know it, to have it be such a part of our life that it, given any opportunity, we can speak the truth of God's word into people's lives. See, we would rather memorize it and quote it and impress people than we would actually live it out. Listen, it's important that we see this. Listen, Jesus was succinct. He didn't go on and on and on. That's what the Pharisees did. Jesus literally, you know, would whittle it down to its finest point. You know, when Thomas, after the resurrection, was doubting, you know, Jesus didn't get together with, with him and say, listen, bud, listen, I'm gonna, we're going to do a little Bible study and I'm going to give you 15 Old Testament reasons and five New Testament reasons. I'm going to explain the depth and the breadth of all the prophecies. No, Jesus simply said, hey, here, just touch me. Feel my wounds. Come taste and see that God is good. It's not that he didn't know the prophecies. He was the prophecies. But he could distill it down so that he could effectively reach people where they were. Instead of intimidating them. Come touch me. See incarnational ministry. Because listen, the world has heard all that we have to say. But they haven't seen who we say we are. Jesus says, I'm alive. I'm resurrected. Here, touch me. We say we're changed. We believe in Jesus. We love everybody. And the world goes, huh, really? You don't even love each other. They want to come and see. Touch it. It needs, the word of God needs to come out of us. It needs to be who we are and what we are. There was one time that we get a recorded Bible study. I wish he would have done more. But he didn't because we would make it a religion. This is how we do Bible study. And we would refine it down until it was beyond approach. Listen, he didn't do that. Only one time, and that was on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection with two guys that weren't part of the 12 who were wondering and asking questions. Jesus just lived the word. That's who we are supposed to be, guys. A living example of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Not just having facts and figures. You know, Jesus didn't even teach his disciples to pray. Did you know that? There's not one recorded place where Jesus had a prayer meeting with his disciples. Not one place where, you know, he was laying out in the, on the, the, the starry night on the, out on the desert there, looked up and said, listen, boys, listen, it's so good to be in God's presence. His, his creation declares his glory. Let me teach you how to pray. After a year and a half, his disciples finally came to him and said, Hey, will you teach us to pray? The Pharisees teach their 
disciples to pray and, you know, your John's teach his to pray. Why don't you teach us to pray? And you know, the Pharisees did pray. They prayed on the corner. They prayed in the parking lot. They prayed in public. They prayed, they prayed, they prayed. And Jesus, you know, and just that's what holiness is, right? How many of us can pray in King James English? Because that's the only holy prayer you can pray, right? No, it intimidates people. It pushes people off. And they look at us as religious nuts. Now listen, it's not that Jesus, you know, you know, didn't pray. In fact, prayer was the foundation of his ministry. Jesus went back and what he had taught him a year earlier in Luke 2, or in Luke uh, 11, okay? On the Sermon on the Mount, he says, when you pray, pray this way. He didn't pray with him. He just said, pray this way. Next time around, his disciples said, he shortened it by five words and said, this is how you should pray. Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't even pray with his disciples. He said, listen, boys, you stay here. I'm going over there to pray. But Jesus modeled it over and over and over again. He would go off by himself and pray. He'd be up all night long praying. He'd be praying for them as he watched them struggle in the sea. Jesus prayed. His disciples prayed. Because see, if he would have told us, this is how you pray, guess what we would do? That's the only way we would pray. Instead, he modeled it and lived it for us. Why? Because I don't think he wanted to intimidate anybody. He didn't want to prove to anybody how spiritual he was. You know, if I would ask you guys right now, hey, listen, we're going to have a little prayer meeting. Okay? You know prayer meeting is least attended of all meetings? But if I'd say, listen, guys, I want you to break up in groups of three and four, and I don't want you to pray with anybody you know. Um, let's break up in little huddles and let's pray. Most of you would faint, not speak a word. Listen, even when I'm asked to pray, I, it blows me away when I go eat lunch with somebody for the first time and they ask me to pray over the meal. Because I go into King James English. No, I simply look to my father and say, Father, thank you for my friends. Thank you for the food that's before me. Amen. Let's eat. The greatest prayer I've ever heard is a young man that's now in the ministry. And it was about 10, 12 years ago that I prayed with him to receive Christ. It was the first time somebody ever prayed the sinner's prayer. And I don't pray it with him. I don't say, repeat after me. Oh God, you know that I'm a sinner. I don't, no. I say, open your heart up to Jesus and just say what's on it. First time I'd ever been around anybody who used four letter words. Okay. And not the good ones. In their sinner's prayer. The most sincere thing I'd ever heard in my entire life. See, Jesus was after that. Not some diatribe thing that we make up to impress people. He modeled that over and over again for us. Listen, he doesn't want to intimidate. He doesn't want to put a guilt trip on anybody. I've had so many people say, I can't pray because I don't pray like you. And said, well, you never heard me pray. It says, run into the throne room of grace as crying out, daddy, daddy. Listen, as, as, a, as a father and as a grandfather, when my kids come in and they come in with a lot of words and tell me how wonderful I am and how great I am and how much they love and adore me, guess what I know is coming next? Yep. They want something. Listen, I'd much rather have my kids come in and say, hey, Dad, this is what's going on in my life. This is the struggle I'm facing. Can you help me? Than to manipulate me with a lot of words. That's why when I pray, I get right to the point. Jesus was right to the point about his ministry. People say, we don't pray enough. That's code word for I don't pray enough. When was the last time you spent, we don't pray enough as a church. When was the last time you spent all night wrestling in prayer 
praying over the body of Christ. Well, uh, they, they never answer that one. Never had anybody say, I've been praying for weeks. Haven't slept a wink. Never had anybody say that. Well, we don't pray enough. They come right back to it. Mm, no, that's code word for you don't pray enough. See, Jesus talked about not public prayer, but about private prayer. About going into your prayer closet. About modeling it and living it. Not just talking about it. You know, when he witnessed to someone, he wasn't intimidating. He didn't force himself on him. The rich young ruler, you know, that young man comes and says, what do I got to do and inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus looked at him and said, sell everything and follow me. We know the story. The guy went off. He says he went off sad. Jesus didn't go, well, time out. Listen, we gotta, let's do a little Bible study. Let's get together a coffee. I'm going to read Ecclesiastes to you, and I'm going to explain how riches are going to fade and go away and that they'll lead you down a road of destruction. No, Jesus said, okay, see you later. We get aggressive instead of just expressing the open invitation and allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work. Jesus knew that he was going to go live out before him love, mercy, and grace. That this young man would see him serve the poor, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, heal the sick. And that that would draw him. That God would draw him. Folks, we have to become more like Jesus. Jesus. Jesus fulfilled this mission statement. Jesus lived out, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is, is he, is the man who takes refuge in him. That's why I'm encouraging us. Because my generation, the next generation, the Z generation is not going to want to hear more from us. They're going to want to see it and then hear it. They want to see us love without condition. They want to see us serve without expecting something in return. They're going to want to hear us speak the words of life. They want us to be like Jesus. We have to take back the term, I'm a Christian. See, Christian literally was a derogatory term that was meant to, to talk down and talk bad about people because they were little Christs. Because they loved and cared and ministered just like he did. They spoke the words of life just like he did. Those people turn the world upside down. We can see our community turned upside down. Jesus was never in a hurry. Jesus never, you know, cared about what others thought. He was concerned with one thing. His father's will. Not whether he was comfortable. Not whether it was convenient but whether or not his father's will was going to be done here on earth. Listen, I'm going to want to lead us to do that. We're taking those steps of redeeming that. But what happens when we commit ourselves to be like Jesus? To fulfill his mission statement. Listen, Jesus says, my burden is easy and my load is light. I'm not looking to weigh us down. I'm looking to free us up. Not with more stuff and more rules and all of that. But for us to just be who we say we are. That the world would stand and go, whatever those weirdos have, I want. Because that's what they'll think of us. Because we're going to love different. We're going to be different. 
we're going to speak different. Jesus said this, as the Father has sent me, I now send you. We're going to take and over the next several weeks, look at how Jesus, you know, came to the poor, what he had to say about it, what he says about those that are bruised and those who carry heavy burdens and those that are, that are sick and those that are held captive by addiction and anger and sin. And, and we're going to look at it from a different perspective. Eyes wide open. That we would see how Jesus came across the culture. Came across the, the grain of religion. And set people free. So are you willing to go on the journey with me? Because I think it's going to be the funnest, most exciting thing that we've ever done. We just try and be who we say we are. Guys, I'm excited and I love you. Let's walk together. It's a journey of life. We'll never arrive, but we can sure start getting there. In a minute, the worship team's going to come up and Rod's going to close this out. And I fixed him because I went seven minutes over. Okay. Last time I ended on time, and I hate that. I thought I went 10 over and was, I was early. But listen, even among us here this morning, there are people who are wounded and hurt and broken. Listen, the promise of the bridge is simple. We're messed up, screwed up. We're going to do our best to love each other. We're going to fail. But we're not going to let failure determine who we are or what we are. It's just another opportunity to begin again and celebrate the grace and the goodness of our God. Why are we this way? That God would be glorified.